do you expect to ever see have you ever seen an actual HP Angelant Keysight clone like and like an actual do you expect it ever clone? like a hundred percent clone? It's got the badge and everything. It pretends to be a, a key side. <laughs> we haven't seen a hundred percent counterfeit. We have seen yep. in, a, in a few cases. I know in the power products where someone took our PC board, depopulated it, put it on a Xerox machine, and copied the board <gasps> out, including our logo. <laughs> and they were so small, they were selling so few that we didn't go after them. But we had several patents right. in that product. We could have taken them out very right. easily, but it wasn't yep. worth the, the cost. They weren't a, got no a threat. Yep. Um, we have had other people do. You know, the front panel looks identical to our product. Yeah. Certainly the functionator, there's someone cloned our uh, 33, yeah. 120. And the menus are practical. I did a video showing the difference between, they're practically identical. So what's interesting in that one is the function, yeah. if you take the help screens, the help screens are copyrighted. And they right. knew not to copy verbatim the help screen, so they changed every uh -huh. fifth word because that gets around the copy. Oh. And yeah. inside, it's not the same function. It's not the right. same. Right? No, 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 no. It's totally off. different hardware. Totally yeah. Inside, but the front panel, the yep. screen, the, the user menus, interface is just identical. Yep. Yeah. And that was a very, very good user interface for its time. Um, Do you think there's possibly code copying going on there, or do they simply write it from scratch and use it as a, <laughs> as a visual template? We see way. Kind of. We see much less of that because. Right. That requires a lot of work to do. You're taking an assembly. Oh, you've got to and disassemble it. And, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's almost a, impossible to. It's not impossible. You right, know, but it's know, a lot of liquid. You put enough monkeys at a typewriter, Shakespeare yeah, will yeah, come out. Yeah. But uh, and yeah. you have seen some people who've spent an inordinate amount of time when they probably could have spent it better developing their own product. But, right. You know, sometimes that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Who for me to question it? We're trying to find ways to keep them from representing yeah. themselves as being us. That's really the challenge. Got it. Is it flattering? Is it part of it flattering? No, oh, yeah, UI is sure, so good sure. that they copied it. You know, sure, is there sure, it's flattering. That? When, you know, yeah. when Samsung copied Apple, right. you know, it was a little yeah. bit flattering. It was also, they lost market. They sued them for a billion dollars, right? Yeah. Um, so Apple was furious when Samsung yeah. stole a lot of what they did. Um, some of it they had no right to patent in the first place, but mm -hmm. a lot of it they did. They created a lot of great concepts. So, yeah, it's flattering, but not that doesn't last very long. The lost business revenue is, stays around. Do you see any future for do it all products? Like, will you ever release like a like a, a meter with a power supply and a function gen and a little scope in it? And so we a, are doing that. You are, sure. Are we, new it, scopes have function. Oh yeah, PMM. yeah, they do. They do, but not in the. Oh well, yeah. For most people, three I and guess and a half they do. Five or the five in one trend, and the, what is it? Ten in one. Some companies are up to now. We call it the busy box. <laughs> the busy the little kids thing with all the little right. toys in his crib, yep. you know. But the fact is, that's a more productive environment for people, yep. and it's you already got the scope hooked yep. up to the circuit. Just tell me what the voltage is. It makes all the sense in the world. If it but it's using the same hardware, though. Would you make a scope that actually had dedicated multimeter? We did that a long time circuitry. Ago. We, we've had scopes with multimeters yep. built in and things yep. like that. Um, I can't go into some details of future stuff, but. If it's a productive environment, we're gonna right. we're gonna do it. If it if it makes sense on the bench and people want it and yep. we can do it well, we're gonna do it. What if it just makes sense in the education thing? Would you just develop products for education or so some of our is that a big enough market? The education yeah. market is huge. It's one of the single largest markets. The right. problem is it's difficult to access at a profitable level. Ah, um, so one of our biggest then, competitors so the makes a dedicated box. They yep. sell almost at a loss, and they give away their software to run this box. Um, and they, they basically, we say we get the kids hooked on our drug first. And every the, kid comes out of school yeah. knowing how to use their software. Mm -hmm. It's a brilliant strategy if you can do it cost effectively. Our, our company has always balked at doing that. We, mm -hmm. we don't want to spend that money that way, and we've avoided it. We haven't been as successful in the education market because mm -hmm. of that. Right. Okay. Do you think that's still the plate and still the case? Or? I think we're always debating how to, we, one of the problems you have is it's such a big size. Mm -hmm. you, you can't avoid it to a certain right. extent. And there's different ways to access that market. I think that the way that our, uh, our scopes team has come out with a low cost effective product that makes the customer familiar with the user interface that mm -hmm. they're gonna sell into when they get into the real world, yep. uh, I think is a smarter move. Um, but there's no right answer. I mean, the fact is as long as it works to carry you through, it makes mm -hmm. sense. We need lower cost products to make education work for us. Yep. You know, $1,000 is a big gulp for someone yeah, putting totally. 50 of them in a lab. Yeah. Okay, and we figured out sometimes with aggressive discounts and you know a special version of the model, mm -hmm. we can sometimes get at it, but it's it's a struggle, frankly. What about uh, providing the teaching material? Because I always thought that could be the seller. 
We're doing that. Uh, yep. We're doing that. Yeah, I know your scope, your educational scope. You've no, got we have some a different program we, we were doing with uh, with IoT test. We're right. making some special versions of products that for IoT education, where there's oh. actually got a class behind it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. IoT wow. is, is big for uh, for us because IoT has got uh, RF in it. We're mm -hmm. the world's largest RF, you know, test and measurement company by yep. far, and IoT is rapidly growing and it's going into all different frequency domains and mm -hmm. uh, new standards are proliferating. It's, it's a huge headache to keep up with it, but you know, if you're in a cell RF gear, you gotta be on top of IoT. On, I, I know you're not in the RF uh, group, or you don't oversee. The I don't RF. oversee any. I don't oversee any, but I just, I'm right. a, yeah, yeah. I, I sit in the background and help people be, become more effective. That's Excellent. How do you see, like sampling technology has gotten so good these days. Mm -hmm. Do you see, um, like spectrum analyzers, they're just like they can, the sampling technology is so good, you can just sample it straight to digital and that's it. Like, we do that up to a certain at, frequency. Up to a certain, at what level is it currently, do you know? <coughs> I think we're in a single digit gigahertz. We're doing right. direct. Okay, direct so anything digital. up to maybe Bluetooth 2.4 gig is possible? That's on the edge, yeah, definitely. Right, it's I on mean, the edge. What it requires is, because you can't buy A to Ds that go that fast. We develop right. our own proprietary yeah. A to D technology. It's all custom ASIC stuff. That's right. Yeah. So we're doing that, and because the higher you go, the more you can do, you can get rid of artifacts. But you also have the problem where if you have uh, uh, interference. If you're mm -hmm. doing external world measurements, it's a problem because you have right. sidebands that are outside the frequency you're trying to digitize and they can overload the front end. So ah, you need of course. effectively when you have a down uh, down converter in the front end, it's tuned. So you take out those mm -hmm. other frequencies before they hit the A to D. So you can get better performance with a down converter than you can with direct digital. Got it. Unless you put, so a, a, unless you put a pre-selector yeah. in front of the thing, which is, you might as well have a down well, converter. Yeah, exactly. So it's always going to be a trade-off. It's always going to be a trade-off. Right, so you're supposed, you need both. You almost need to have two different grades of instrument. Well, if you're if you're Probably. doing like, and you can disconnect the antenna and you can just plug it right on the output mm -hmm. of the, amp the transmitter, then you don't have those sidebands, do you? Right. So much. Uh, true. But if you're hooking it up, uh, and picking to, off, uh, off, the picking off, uh, off an antenna or something, yeah, yeah. then it becomes a problem. So there's there's opportunity for both. Manufacturing. You were talking about manufacturing last night and the evolutions in manufacturing. Right. Oh yes. So well, quite a one of the things, the biggest disruptive change in the last, my whole career has been the transition from electronics being about the industrial market to the mm -hmm. consumer market. When I started, the consumer market didn't exist. Right. I mean, it was television sets and they were CRT. Yeah. And they were NTSC in the U.S., you know. Pal here. Yeah, pal yeah. here. And it was really crude. And you, right. can, you go and look at an NTSC. Oh, I yeah. I watch I, that. I, I, exactly. <laughs> we thought that was okay. <laughs> <laughs> and... That's transformed to where now, the, you know, at one point in time, we were the largest customer of analog devices. Mm -hmm. We were their number one customer. Right. Today, we're not even top 20. Not a, right. Wow. Consumer is... That's interesting. It's taken over, and the, the, yeah. that's growing. I mean, consumer electronics is growing so fast and so pervasive, you know, mm -hmm. and electronics in general, all the mechanics in cars are changed to electronics. All the airplanes, all the tanks, yeah. all the uh, mm -hmm. stuff is electric motors. It's not hydraulics anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, gas engines are going to go away soon. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, countries are banning gas engines inside their cities. So that's all going to electronics. So that, that's the, the, the biggest change I see is just the sheer volume of electronics. And it's, it's the wave is not even halfway through mm -hmm. to change every elect electric system, electric system to electronic system. I mean, think like you take a light bulb. A light bulb, you just put a, a filament of wire across the line. Yeah. It heats up and it gets hot and it lights up. Now it's got a, a electronic ballast that's driving an LED, uh -huh. and, and it's got an RF communication device. So it's what I mean. It's just the, the transformation is just uh, amazing. How much more electronics mm. there is in everything we own, and how much it's changing, and in ways that you, you look at it today and say that's it's, it's already finished. No, it's not even close to finished. Mm -hmm. You know, today when you buy a light, those are those are still fluorescent bulbs, right? No, LEDs. Everything in here is LED. So, yep. But those light bulbs are in the form of the long... Uh, they're in the tubes. original form factor, right. yeah. Well, in a few years, yeah. the actual panel, those, yes. those things are going to be the lights. Yes. Because LEDs yeah. like being flat. Yep. Okay, but you're still using a form factor that's driven from the, the fixtures and all the things. Mm -hmm. You take a lamp and you screw a light bulb in. Well, why do you need a screw-in light bulb if it's yeah. an LED? They never fail. So you don't need that screw at the bottom of the light bulb. In fact, why do you need the shade mm -hmm. around the light? You need the shade yes. because the light bulb's hot and you don't want to get near it and touch it. Yeah. It's like a guard, and it yeah. also diffuses the light. Well, they can make an LED where that the, the shade the is the thing. LED, yeah. but they haven't yet, but they're going to, and it's not exactly. going to be replaceable. When the lamp breaks, you're going to throw it away. Mm -hmm. So there's, And that's just a simple tr trite example, but there's so much of the stuff where we've only started to see the changes, and it's going to change everything. In your car, 
when it becomes autonomous, the whole way your car is laid out, you're going to have seats facing backwards. Mm -hmm. Because, right, why face forward? Why face forward? <laughs> right. And it does. Th and there's there's all these ripples that haven't yeah. happened yet that to me are are what's amazing. It's like the ride is just beginning. We're mm -hmm. just the first. We just went to the first top of the first roller coaster, and there's mm -hmm. many more rides that are going to happen, and it's all going to change more than we can even imagine. That's what I find the coolest thing about it. What are the big changes coming up in test and measurement? Do you have like a vision of the... I think the big changes in test and measurement, some of this is the synthetic instruments. The, the right. multiple instruments participating in a greater solution is one of the biggest things. Mm -hmm. Software today, you know, we do front panels because you can't get good latency. Yep. Except, believe it or not, the video game industry can't handle that that latency. You can buy special keyboards and controllers right. and stuff. Yeah. That stuff, is the computer interfaces, 5G has super low latency so you mm -hmm. can control things wirelessly. There's a good chance in 10 years all our test and measurement equipment is not going to have I.O. cables. Mm -hmm. It's going to be 5G, ultra low latency, and it's all going to be synthetic. Front panels are going to disappear. It's all yeah. going to be through software interfaces, and they're all going to be touch and easy to use and all that. Mm -hmm. Even though everybody likes this and it's comfortable, Yep, it's not going to stick around. It's not going to stick around. You think everything's going? I don't know how long. Big screen take. touch. I no mean, more knobs. I remember when we used to go out right. to talk to engineers, and we'd say, "How do you feel about a PC controlling your instrument?" And yeah. Twenty years ago, ten years ago, they said, "No way." They they grow. Now, know. if you go out and most engineers bench, and it's funny because yours isn't like this. They all have an arm, one of these. Oh yeah, arms yeah, arms with, with a, with a I, I used to have one. Yes. Yeah, and then you have a PC under their bench. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they have a LAN a, router along the back of their bench, right. and they pop all their instruments in, and they, and they bring the schematic up on one. My, I have two articulated arms on my mm -hmm. bench in my basement. One I bring schematics up on, and one I, I have. I don't use it for displaying the test equipment, but I'll bring up like a, a YouTube video on how to do a mm -hmm. repair, and I'll have the schematic there. More and more, PC is part of the bench. Yep. So. What the engineer said, I don't want the PC controlling my instruments. How long do you think that's going to last? Right. So it's, it just doesn't change overnight. And a lot of it is the people in charge are the ones who did it the old way. Mm -hmm. And they eventually retire. Got it. And then when that starts to happen, then people roll over. And next thing you know, why wouldn't you want it that way? Mm -hmm. Why did we ever do it the other way again? Like, right. we watched NTSC, you know, or PAL or whatever. You, and you look back and say, you know, now you hang your TV on the wall. Right. 20 years ago, you bought a big cabinet that was this deep, and you put this big... 35 pound, you know, mm -hmm. or 150 pound actually for a 35 inch TV. And now you see them sitting on the curb free, right? right. The TV and the thing that holds it. How do you think feel about knobs? Because even it's the Microsoft, they, they have the knob that you can just put on top of your Surface tablet and it, you know, because people still like the tactile Yes, feedback. and there's, there's things How that just you, work great. How do you yeah. deal with that? That's a great question. And they're, yep. they're constantly struggling with that, you know, when Apple did the, the touch Mm -hmm. They started to do things, but there's still things that doesn't do great. Yep. You know, and then there was a period of time where everybody had a fingerprint reader to get into your phone. Oh, right, yeah. And now yeah. Apple's trying to get rid of that yeah. and use 3D face. Uh, they claim it's, it's going to be great. And uh, if anybody well, could do it, they could yeah. do it, but we're still Maybe. Out. Maybe, right. Yeah. So it's going to require, you know, evolving and changing and, and adapting. The knob may never go away. Right. You know, or they may find some brilliant way that you use your hands and gestures. You know, BMW has the gestures in the car now. Have you seen right. this? Right. Uh, no, you yeah, the, you can just... Turn the, the volume air. up. You put your finger up yeah. in the air and you go yep. like this and the volume goes up. Yep. Uh, I don't know. Yep. You know, and you can make the screens like this in the air. Just like yep. Tom uh, Cruise in Minority yes, Report. Yes, exactly. You know? Swipe in the yeah. air. In the air. You don't have to touch. Yeah. You just do it in the air. Yeah. And whether or not that pans out it's actually safe in a car, who knows? But there's right. people trying every possible avenue. You know somebody's going to break through with something yep. and it's going to change. Whether or not the knob goes away or you're going to stick a knob down on your tablet or on the screen, yep. who knows? Right. It's hard to say for sure, but it will change. And it will change in ways we can't even imagine today. That's the mm. best part. Please keep the knob. I like the knob. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not up to me. It's what customers accept. And there's, if we sure. get rid of it and everybody else keeps it and we lose sales, we'll bring it back. You know? yep. right. like we just don't get something stupid and change it because somebody thought it was cool. Right. But there's always that constant experimentation to try new things and figure out what sticks. Ah. Right. Could retro become a thing in test instruments, maybe? You know, could it, you know, like everyone's going, oh, portable tablet oscilloscopes, and then all of a sudden, no, and then 20 years down the track, everyone goes, no, I want my I, real I knobs there, and my... I think there's always, you know, thingy, yes. back guard and, and forward guard and retro yeah. and all that, it, but it's not as big in the test and measurement industry because it's it's there for a business it's, purpose. It's a, yeah. It's not a hobby thing. I mean, for the yeah. hobbyist, there's certain things that, because they're inexpensive, like you can buy these little tiny scopes that hook up to the USB. Yeah, right. You know, and they, they go into your phone. Well, that's great, but 
how many people can actually use that. Yeah. It's not bad if you're playing with a Raspberry Pi and on your mm -hmm. bench and you just want to play, but to actually get real work done, it's not super yeah. effective. And you know, let's face it, that scope doesn't look all that different than a scope, the, the 1740 no, you have no. here. It really yeah, doesn't. Yeah, exactly. In fact, one of the things that our, our scope team learned was that they like separate knobs for each of the channels. It's absolutely. Because we yeah. had scopes for a while that yeah. had one knob and you yeah, could do no, something. Yeah, no, 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 no. And no. they found out that, yep. you know, that just isn't what people want. No, that's right. right. Simple stuff. And in fact, you'll see on the new power supply, we have a voltage knob and a current knob. Because our exactly. feedback was that yep. people, you know, what? want yeah. both. They don't want to have to press set. Oh, they don't want to have to toggle press, it. I'll, I'll toggle it between the, the two. Well, we like yeah. to joke, too, because power supplies are the only piece of test equipment that we make that can maim and kill. <laughs> right. Okay. So we want people to have a lot of confidence yep. or, or destroy your device under test, which mm -hmm. can cost a thousand times more than this power supply. Yep. So we want people to be really confident they're getting what mm -hmm. they wanted with no surprises. Like, oh, that's 50 volts, not 5 volts. Yep. Oh, my yep. God. <laughs> How do you get... Because I probably find that the key sight velocity controls on your knobs are probably the best I've used. How do you get, how do you choose the right, you know, like you turn it and it gets quicker and quicker and quicker and like how do you... We make everybody try it. And make everyone try it and you did, like, we actually do listen. you find there's a bell curve of people who like some, like do you just go for the center of the bell curve or do you, do you find everyone sort of converges upon a... Once you get it right, thing. we've had like when it we just first feels started, right. when we, when we first did it, there was a lot of not so good. And then mm. once somebody gets it on any product gets it right, then we can use that as a model and we can right. it's easier. It's much easier once you get it right the first time. But a lot of it is we use our own products. Got to eat your own dog food as they yeah. say. Yeah, next, yep. next bench still works for some things. <laughs> right. And one of the biggest problems we have is when we get somebody who goes off and develops something mm -hmm. and they're just, they have 100% control personally of all mm -hmm. those details, that we've made some of the worst feeling products. Interesting. They, they control everything. When you, they they, they kind of go off and yep. do something themselves and then you, you go and look at it and go, well, this isn't right. And then they fight you because they have control. Right. Whereas when yep. you do it more in a, in a team environment, then you tend to filter out those kind of really three sigma bad decisions. That's interesting because I would imagine that Going for the team approach can be, well, going for the individual approach can either be hit or miss. Either the, like That's it's right. a complete miss or it's a complete win because that person controlled everything. That's correct. But the, is it more diluted with the like design by committee kind design of thing? Design by you committee, I mean? you don't get the highs, you don't get the lows. Right, yeah, yeah. You get in the middle. Yep. We had a design we did on our logic analyzers, had one knob. Yes, I remember that. And the guy who worked for them worked for our voltmeter team for a while and mm -hmm. he kept trying to get us to do that again. Right. And oh, on your vault. On, our, on everything. On everything. He thought that was the greatest solution, and everybody who used his logic analyzer hated it, but he thought it was incredible. Right. Because he was too close to it, and he couldn't see, yep. and he didn't listen to his customers as much as he probably should have. Wow. But he kept insisting, and his code is in here. He did the, actually the oh, graphics libraries really? for all these products. So he's a great engineer, yeah, yeah. but when he carried it all the way to the final UI, it wasn't as good. And right. We would, he was fantastic at a coding level, creating mm -hmm. graphics libraries, which, like I said, he wrote all the graphics libraries for all these products. Mm -hmm. But uh, when, he, when you put him in charge of the whole UI, you didn't like the, right. his, he, he was kind of that three sigma that you probably shouldn't listen to for that. <laughs> yeah, right. But he, he, along the way, he was, a, he was like the most amazing graphics guy. I mean, it's literally used in every single one of our products. Do you find that you're, when it's only developed internally with no outside Control? Do you get stuck in your box sometimes? Oh, You've got your so much, so is, much, is, so much. That's yep. one of my biggest frustrations. I call it a failure of imagination. Mm. You know, it, it, it's it's very much the, one of my favorite analogies. Is that did you ever see the Brady Bunch movie? Yes. And you know, the father mm. every time he tries to do an architecture of a gas station or something else, it's his house with a pump in front. <laughs> <laughs> and I use that analogy. Say, you know, you keep trying to take what you did before and just do it again because it felt great when you were great at it right. and that's one of the biggest curses our biggest successes trap us we try to replicate our biggest successes mm -hmm. and the, the, the antithesis to that is that when I was a kid you could buy two kinds of sneakers you could buy Adidas Superstar leather very expensive mm -hmm. very nice or you could buy Converse Canvas right. in the US and today if you go into Foot Locker yeah. how many kinds of sneakers are there? 10 zillion isn't there? Yeah. I don't know I haven't yet. <laughs> the fact is this function of this voltmeter is yeah. very close to what the 34401 did. Yeah, it mm -hmm. has capacitance right. and it has yeah, data yeah, logging, yeah. but it's pretty but it's, much the same. Yep. And the fact is there's so many other opportunities mm -hmm. to, to go sideways into yep. different things. And we're looking at that now more, 
But the, the tendency is saying, no, we nailed it then, and there's nothing beyond that. And that's All just right. not correct. And the markets always fragment over time. They turn into multiple different things. And our competitors show us that in so many ways. If you look at that power supply from one of our competitors over oh, there, right. you know, that's a very different way to do a power product. Yes. It's not inexpensive. No, but... But it can do things that we yep. can't do with any of our power products. Yep. It's very imaginative re-looking at, you know, how things work. And we need to do more of that, frankly. Not get pigeonholed into, I yep. mean, our scopes group is probably one of the best at that. They figured out it was really useful to have a function editor built right into the scope, mm. right? Yeah, it was yeah. the first, were you guys the first one to put a function editor? I think so. I and, think it worked. And our reaction yeah. when we were developing the function editors was, how dare they do that? Yeah, right. Except if customers want it, how dare us to say we shouldn't do it just because yep. we have that charter? The fact is, nature will find a way mm -hmm. you know, from Jurassic Park. Right. The fact is, if that's the better answer, we got to get there. Uh -huh. Or if we don't, somebody else will. And to put our head in the sand and act like, mm. I can't believe they did that. They're hurting our sales. Well, so, somebody else was going to do it if we didn't. You have yep. to eat your young. You really have to replace yourself, whether you like it or not. And if you don't, somebody else will. But with that example of the function Jenny and the scope, I noticed you did cripple it. Somewhat. It's a simple DDS. It's, it's a simple. And it's grounded, yes. It's, it probably delay. I know you uh, later on you added firmware. Actually, after I complained, I think that it didn't have ARB capability. You added it like three months, six months yeah. later or something yeah, in was, software. There, there, there was a gap. The first one actually came with just pure function generated. Then after yep. that, I think it was about three to six months, you yeah. actually had the full ARB. The so full ARB capability. And, and, and that stay, was stay tuned. There's more yeah. to come. But right. uh, the fact is, they were innovative because they actually broke the mold. Now, they had mm. no allegiance to preserving the lines between different products before, and it was a valuable yeah. addition to the market. People love yeah. that feature in the yes. product. Yes, yeah, okay. totally. The mixed signal, which they invented, was a, now it's all over the place. You yeah. can't imagine a scope without mixed signal. Exactly. That's like thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. And when the people who figure that out are the ones who really get ahead. Yeah. It's when you pigeon yourself, pigeonhole yourself into a narrow mm -hmm. thing, the world passes you by. Right. And that's what we have to avoid. And we've been guilty of it in, in some cases. And... Uh, part of my job as a change agent is to shake the tree and keep that from happening. Awesome. I've got to ask, the MegaZoom 4 ASIC is now, I think I did the math the other day, and it's like seven plus years old. How old is the Keysight, how old is the original 2000, 3000X series now? Uh, it's seven? Is it seven years? Yeah, it's, it's, it's about, yeah. did the MegaZoom 4 came, came out with the, yes, it came out with the, the launch of the... Yeah, with we the called 2000X. it Jackal. It was a project. Oh, Jackal. Jackal, yeah. And then Coyote. Do you have internal code names for everything? We do. Cool. We do. It was Jackal, Coyote, Wolfhound, yep. and Marsupial. That one's what Marsupial. Ah, that's right. Is, is it written on the board? No, it's in somewhere. It could be. Yeah, it's right. It's somewhere. Yes. Um, so, all of our projects. This was Tories. Yeah. Oh, Tories. Tories, which is, I guess, right. um, the, the pine tree in the... Oh. Or no, it was one of the mountains in Colorado. Okay. If I'm not mistaken. It was Tories. Yes, and uh, the funk generator was Garfield because they named them, and Nermal and uh, Arlene from the comic. Oh yes, from the yeah from Garfield comic. Yep. Yeah. Wow. And uh, cool. Yeah, each project that's one of the fun parts is to come up with a name that that means something to people on the project team. Got it. And all in turn. Are there fights over who gets to? Um, no, win, usually a few a people are really good at getting names. No, right. No, certain couple. people are good at coming up with names, and other people right. aren't. And. Uh, my favorite one was one that I got involved in. I developed a product about 20, 25 years ago to manufacture lithium ion batteries. Mm -hmm. And I picked a, a good name, but it wasn't a great name. And we called the project Mufasa because it, lithium ion looks like lion. So it was the Lion King. It was Mufasa. Ah, right. And we okay. were selling this in Japan, and we go yep. over there, and the Japanese said to me, but John san, uh, Mufasa dies, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and like, oh God, and you're right, the project right. was not successful. So uh, recently, we, we've been uh, coming into that market again because uh, the automotive energy uh, yeah. market, and we developed a product. And the, the, the person I work with in the original project was involved in the second project, and I was only involved in helping transfer the technology. Um, they called the project G3. Mm -hmm. And no one knows G what that means. Right. It turns out he is an Italian, and he loves the Godfather movies. Ah, and he calls it G3 for Godfather 3 when just when uh, Al Pacino thought he was getting out of the mafia, he was pulled back in. Right. So this was just when we thought we were getting out of the lithium ion battery market, we were <laughs> pulled back in. <laughs> it's Interesting. one of these subtle things you'd have to be part yeah, of the yeah, project you would, team. You but wouldn't know otherwise. Yeah, project names are fun. Yep. They're not supposed to get out. We, we've yep. actually had... Uh, oh, it's fun when you, when you put it on the board. You know, I like doing a teardown and there's some personalized... 
Please we've allow had, them to put more personalized stuff inside. Well, I, we had many stories. One okay. of the projects I developed was the um, the 66,000 modular power supply with the plug-in mm -hmm. snap-in right. with the displays on each one. And we had a remote keyboard for it. And we hit an Easter egg in the keyboard. Yeah. But if you held down certain keys, it played, it scrolled the names of all the project team members and beeped the beeper with Morse code because the guy was a radio buff. Right. And we were at one of these internal training events and the engineer turned on the Easter egg to show it to somebody else. And the beep was loud enough that one of our top managers who was a radio buff was going, Ed Gilbert, John Kenny. And he was, he was reading the Morse code. <laughs> reading the Morse code. And he <laughs> went, who has Morse code in their product? And he came over and at that time, That's great. there was a big stink because somebody else used like 30 or 40% of the code space to put videos oh. of the project team in the product. Oh, and they got wow. in big trouble for it. Yeah, and we yeah. got kudos because we, we encoded it in Morse code, which is super efficient yep. and only took 1% of the code space. That's only 1%. <laughs> How much did the old, because the old um, HP scopes used to have the, um, and, and I've got one there, which is, yep. This had Tetris in it. Yes, it had uh, Tetris, and one of them uh, had um, the Asteroids. Asteroids. Yeah. Asteroids game. How much code space was? No idea how much no, it actually right. takes, but all I remember was we got like we were thought we were going to get in trouble because it was right after he got furious because they wasted so much time and yeah. code doing it, and when he realized we did it in Morse code, first of all, being a radio buff made him think it was cool for that. Right. But then he said, and you know, it's even better. It's in Morse code, so it's super compacted, efficient, and we didn't get in trouble at all. <laughs> <laughs> right, so engineers can still get away with that if it's not detrimental to... A little bit goes a long yeah. way. Right. It does, okay. you know, things that make the team feel good about the yeah, project yeah, is, totally. uh, definitely helps. Yep. Uh, a little bit goes a long way, though. Mm. It's been one of the strange things. The one I always remember the closest is um, the original Macintosh. Right. All yes. the design engineers scrolled uh, sign, They signed their name in the case, and it was embedded in the case. It was embedded in the inside Moldy. of the case. Yeah, in the molding of the case, yeah. So yeah. you can... You I've, can I've, I've got one. Yeah, a, yeah. yeah, I made the mistake of buying one at a garage sale, and then realizing I didn't want to play with it because it was disc-based, and really you yep. couldn't do much with it. Now they're worth like thousands yeah. of dollars. If they yep. still work, they're worth thousands of dollars. Uh, anyway, can, so can we see signatures at one point inside? Maybe. I guess you could if we molded stuff. I mean, it's like putting your finger in the concrete, right? right? Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, there's been all that diff neat. different kind of stuff. It's one of the strange arcania mm. part of the project development is getting yep. that kind of stuff hidden in the product. But it's not frowned upon? Well, it's, it's at, at some level it will be. At some level you'll cross a line and... Yeah. Yeah, okay. But and it's part of it now the projects are yeah. expected to go so much faster today. One of the, yeah. the things that's, you know, staying up with the competition and we try to get products done in 12, 15, 18 months today. Mm -hmm. We just take three and a half, four years. Yep. And wow. larger project teams and you know more custom stuff now, we try to use more off the shelf and get it done mm -hmm. much, much faster. And the cost of money today is, is much higher. You know, Engineers get paid much more than they did 20 years ago. So we have to get it done in less time to make profit. Yep. And the expectation now that we're a solely a test and measurement company is that we we can't use any excuses. Oh, we gave mm -hmm. all the money to corporate. Right. Yeah, yeah. We have to stand on our own as a profitable exactly. entity with that's growing because we want to be a growth stock, not just a cash cow. Mm -hmm. So that means we got to get lots of products out because you grow by getting more products out. Got You're it. trying to hit the home runs and make the perfect product. It ain't happening. Right. I mean, it's it. rare. Every now and then you see one mm -hmm. light up the sky, but it's the home runs happen so infrequently. Most of the test and measurement, it's the next one that's somewhat better, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit less money for a little bit more capability. There are disruptive new technologies that come, but they're rare. Got they're it. much less common. That gets back to my original question before we got sidetracked. The 2000-3000X series, it's long overdue. And well, it's, it's almost... long overdue. We're, we're certainly looking at the next evolution of right. the teams. You know, uh, th that's obviously no secret. You, no, see, everyone knows you've got to be working on the there's next. There's a magic to not doing scope. it too quickly, though, to yep. making sure you get okay. all the value out of the investment. Yes. And also waiting till the disruptive changes that your competitors are introducing, mm -hmm. market needs change. So Because it's a huge expense. To develop those chipsets took over five years. Uh, five years to develop the Mega Zoom 4, even though you had the Mega Zoom 3. Was it a complete... Would you know? Was new, it a complete all redesign? Asics. All new ASICs. Uh, yeah, but was it a complete redesign in terms of architecture? Yeah. Oh, it was. Okay. Oh, absolutely. From the ground up. Yeah, the Mega Zoom Three, I believe they brought it into a processor to display the the, the Mega Zoom oh, Four. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. They have a the the, the digital ASIC has yeah. a display built in. Hence the screen. And in fact, on the higher end Wolfhound product, this the what's 6, the Wolfhound? 000, oh, that's oh, the Wolfhound. That's the four thousand code name. Um, yep. They actually use a, a processor with a camera interface, and they take right. the 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 ASICs output into the processor as a video right. and then overlay the higher resolution information. 
See, that's the only way they can get a higher resolution outcome because right. the chip is hard coded at a certain resolution. Yes, yes, so, it is. Yeah. So in order to continue to use that chipset and extend its life, they had to do it that way. Mm -hmm. So obviously, we're not going to do it that way going forward. We're going to take it to the next level. But there, yep. there, there's, this is a huge part of the, the scope market. We went from being a smaller player than the attack to number product. one. Did you? We're become neck and neck, one and of course, when, our competitors aren't standing still. Yeah, no, no, there. In terms of memory space, like the the key site still rules in terms of response and user interface kind of, you know, uh, yep. stuff and you know, speed of updating that sort of stuff, but lags behind because of the limitation in the ASIC, the amount of uh, sample memory, the size of the screen, as you said, is limited to 800 by 600. You can't get any bigger. You can't. So so they're obviously looking at all that now. And, mm. But you there's a, there's a magic time. You don't want to go so soon that you don't. Mm -hmm pick up enough update and you don't you advertise the cost of yep. making those chips um, but you don't want to wait so long that you lose you know you don't want your markets to grow and then shrink a little bit because it's, it, you're better off so the next growth comes at the peak of the previous growth yes correct. getting that right and not over investing and not under investing is is pretty tricky stuff got it so they're they're clearly working on the next step but exactly yep. when you're going to see it I can't get into that once you jump up that much in market share, mm -hmm. then you have the, the wherewithal to make that next investment. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot, they've got a much bigger revenue today than they did when they did the first ones. Yep. When they did the first ones, it was more of a leap of faith. Right. Because they weren't there, and yes, now they're there. Yes, exactly. So, yep. but the same, you know, I know that the, the, the manager of that whole operation, he cautioned his team not mm -hmm. to just redo the next chip so quickly because mm -hmm. they, did, they didn't right. necessarily have enough of the insights that really would do a disruptive change, okay? and. That's, you can't just do incremental small stuff. Mm -hmm. The investment for that is too high and you don't get, you become pigeonholed. You start doing things that look like the last one. You do yep. a Brady Bunch problem. You know, you just, everything looks like your next last house. <laughs> to do that really disruptive change, you have to take a deep breath, wait a little bit, wait mm -hmm. a little bit, and then you really make a big change.